morning, Pit Larvey family. Welcome to worship today. Today, what you're going to see is a recording from our 9 a.m. service today. We're so glad that you would take part and join us and worship with us in this way. We hope that you're going to find this worship experience to be a helpful tool for you. We hope that you're using it in a way where until you're ready to come back to church full time, face to face, you'll use this as a tool. But very quickly, as soon as you can, We'd love for you to join either our church or your church or some church face-to-face -face with a community of believers and worship together. Today's going to be a good day. We're going to open the scriptures together. We're going to sing and we're going to honor Jesus. Why don't we pray and we'll get started. Our Father, we love you. We thank you for today. We pray that you would help us to worship in spirit and in truth with everything that we do focused on Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's get started. Good morning, good morning, Pedal Harvey family. Welcome to worship today. We're thrilled that you're here. Today is a big day. we got a lot going on. We're going to ask a lot of you this morning and this afternoon, all in an effort to fulfill our Great Commission responsibilities. You know, to our church, our hope is that we see ourselves once we're kind of joined together as a church family, that every member would be a minister to somebody, and every member would be a missionary somewhere. And so, over the next few days, whenever you've got an activity here at the church and the whole community is going to show up, or in the next few days, when the whole community will literally show up at your doorstep, it is a great time to put on a smile, tell folks about Jesus, and love your community. Today, as we worship, we want to worship in two ways. We want to engage our minds and our hearts in the way that Jesus told us that we would worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so we're going to engage in worship today with everything we've got. Love them with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. Why don't you turn your attention to the screens. We want to give you a couple of announcements, introduce you to somebody, and we'll get started. Good morning, and welcome to Petal Harvey. We are so glad you've joined us for worship today. Here's what's going on. Today at 5 is our annual Trunk or Treat. Make sure to check in with your Sunday School class to see how you can serve. Classes, please have your trunks ready to go at 4 p.m. Upward registration is ongoing. For an early bird discount of $10, make sure to register your basketball players and cheerleaders during the month of October. We also invite you to stop by one of our tables in the Commons and see how you can be involved in Upward this season. Wednesday, November 10th at 6.15 p.m., we will have a church-wide Veterans Day service. If you have served in our armed forces or are currently active duty, we want to know who you are. Check with your Sunday school teacher or come by the church office and fill out an info card. The Lord continues to bless us at Petal Harvey. Please join us in welcoming our newest members. Good morning, church family. I want to introduce you to Savannah Hogan, uh, wife of Kennedy Hogan. Of course, you know Kennedy. He's grown up in our church. And, uh, and Savannah, his wife, uh, they come this morning. Savannah is coming to join our church family. They feel like this is where the Lord would have them plant their family and to grow. And so uh, Savannah comes, Kennedy's coming. They, they've also got Ryder back in the nursery. And so uh, as you see them around campus, would you welcome them uh, as part of our church family? Thanks again for joining us today. That's what's happening at Petal Harvey. Amen. Why don't we stand? Let's go ahead and get ready to pray. We'll sing and we'll worship our King today. Today we're going to turn back a little later in the service. We'll be back in Psalm chapter 119. So why don't you go ahead and kind of find your spot and get ready. We'll be there in just a few minutes. Let's pray. Our Father, we love you. All praise, all glory, all trust, and all hope to you. We have great trust through Christ in God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves or anything of ourselves, but that God ha is our sufficiency and that God has made us sufficient to be ministers of Jesus Christ. So Father, through what you do to make us whatever and however you created us to be, this morning in worship, Lord, we surrender. We ask that you would show us our sins. If there be any wicked way in us. 
And then, Father, this morning as we sing, this morning as we worship, you bring those thoughts to our minds so that we might repent, we might confess. When we open your word, we pray that your word would stir our hearts, that your spirit would help us to confess that in every area of our lives, you are Lord. May we, Lord, follow you today. We love you. We surrender everything we've got to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stay standing? Let's sing together. Join us as we declare the greatness of our God together this morning. Let's sing. Oh Lord, my God. As we continue to praise the Lord, would you be seated? Our choir is going to sing for us this morning. Nothing can stop the hallelujahs that we bring. You worship with us as our choir leads.
today, our God is still good. Nothing can take our hallelujah. Can we stand again together, continue to praise Him? Let's give our praise to King Jesus this morning as we sing.
Today we turn our eyes upon King Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Sing this great hymn with us this morning as we continue. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Jesus, 
our glory and our pride. We adore you, behold you, our Savior ever true. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. Oh, Jesus, we turn our eyes our eyes to you today no matter what we face no matter what we're going through there's only one place to turn and it's to you into your loving embrace into your strong arms that are there for us no matter no matter what we're going through God we're just so grateful for your presence in this place today as we've sung today we're really grateful for your goodness and for your grace that that we can turn our eyes upon you our our strength and our treasure and God, we can turn our eyes to your word. It's truth with no mixture of error. It's got answers for what we face. So God, as we look today to your word, we pray that you'd fill our pastor with your spirit. God, you'd do a work in our hearts and that you'd be, be honored by the ways that, that when we're done today that we obey. So God, work in our hearts today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As you're being seated, man, what a wonderful time of worship we've just had uh, worship doesn't start, however, whenever the music ends. What it really does is it ushers us into the proper place to be able to take our Bibles. So why don't we do this this morning? Take your Bible, and I want you to turn with me. You probably let it fall just however your Bible naturally opens at this point. You've been reading through the Psalms. We've been preaching through the Psalms. Your Bible may just naturally fall there. Let's go to Psalm chapter 119. Chapter, chapter 119. It's interesting whenever you talk about the Psalms. The Psalms are a little bit different than uh, most other places in the Bible because in particular when you're talking about the Psalms, if you're talking about all of the Psalms, if you're talking about the book, it is always the book of Psalms, plural. P-S-A-L-M-S. But anytime you zero in your thought on something and you find just one, it is always the psalm, chapter number, whatever it is. And the idea is that the psalms are built kind of like the Bible. The Bible is a collection of 66 different books, broken up in two different sections with 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, written over the course of almost about 1,600 years by 40 different authors, and yet... It only ever tells one story. See, part of what we know and part of what we affirm that this book is different than any other book you've ever read is the fact that it's the only one that you can pick up knowing that not a single word was misused, not a single phrase is throwaway, and not a single moment is without importance cultivated together in such a way where you've got such differences and yet such unity. You take any book you've ever read any other place, there are places where authors have cut and copied and pasted. It's gone to editors and they've circled with red pens and they've taken this and they've changed that word. But our Bible doesn't come to us that way. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us about itself, it says that everything that we have in our Bible is inspired by God through His Spirit, which means that every author of the Word began to write, and as they began to write, the Holy Spirit began to provide the words. You say, I don't understand how all that works. Well, here's the thing, I don't think any of us fully will. Because we cannot explain an infinite God with just our finite brains. But I can tell you this. When God put together His Word, He left no room, not even wiggle room for error. Which is why you and I can base our life on what it says. So pure is God's Word that as God sent His Son... He said His Son was the Word. So pure 
And so without error, without stain, without problem is our Bible that when Jesus came into the world, God said about him, he is the word made flesh dwelling among us. Pure, spotless, blameless, absolutely trustworthy. Obviously, from Psalm chapter number 1 to Psalm chapter number 150, the longest book of the whole Bible, you'll, you obviously know by now, this book covers a wide variety of topics that are going to be important in your daily life. But in this psalm, it's all about the importance of God's Word. And how when God speaks His Word into our hearts, His Word begins to enhance every other aspect of our lives. Years ago, I I remember I went fishing with my dad. We grew up fishing. And we'd go to lakes and we'd go to rivers and it kind of became the norm where we lived uh, in, in northwest Louisiana that they would, they would put in man-made locks and dams to, to, to kind of to keep the water at certain levels. And there were these little places. There was the lock where you would drive in, you would boat in on one gate. But the lake or the river was 20 foot higher on the other side of the wall. So you come in down here, and what would happen is we would come in, and they would shut the gate, and they would seal it off, and they'd hit a button. And all of a sudden, the water began to rise where we were, meeting the level so that whenever they opened the gate, we would just be right on top of it. Likewise, when we came back through, we'd enter in through that same gate, and we'd kind of we'd get in the middle of it, you know, and then put the boat there in park and kind of kill it for a second. And they'd lock those gates, and they'd hit that button, and that water would drain back down so that we would be on equal level on the other side. Here's what I found in my life. There are a lot of days when I come to the Word, and I don't feel like reading the Word. Now listen, you're perfect. I got that. I'm just confessing me here. I committed my life a long, long time ago that I was going to wake up every day of my life and at some point in my day I'd read God's Word, even if it weren't more than just a couple of verses. And I remember those early days, I was a teenager. I remember I'd, I'd, be, at a, I'd be at a friend's house on a Friday night and we'd go and see a movie, we'd go out to eat, we'd go out to see our friends. And I remember it being, being 11 o'clock and, and we're just kind of sitting there and I think, good grief, I hadn't read my Bible today. And I'd jump up and I'd find their family Bible staying at their house. And I'd open it up and I'd read. And I don't know if I got a whole lot out of moments like that, but what I do know is that God's Word never returns void. And I said, I'm going I'm, I'm to be in the Word at least a little bit every day. Trained a pattern in my life. But it still didn't make me to where every single day I wake up and I go, you know what I want to do right now? Because I'm not a morning person. I don't wake up like ready to sing with the birds. Matter of fact, at no point in the day do I want to sing to any birds. But I especially don't wake up in the morning and go, let's all be excited about life and let me spend time reading about, listen, that's not me right now. Now, you get me about an hour after I wake up, a couple of hours, I'm good to go for life. Prior to that, I hate everybody and everything, so just leave me alone. But here's what I found in reading my Bible is that on the days when I don't feel like reading my Bible, if I will let the discipline of reading it push me where the feelings aren't there yet, if I let the discipline take me where my feelings don't want to go yet, Some days I got the feelings, I'm ready and I'm excited, I'm in and I'm all about it. Other days, it's just discipline. You do it because you're disciplined to do it. Here's what I found. When I come in low, the Lord locks the gate behind me. And by the time I'm out, the water level has risen to carry me to the other side. And there are a lot of days whenever maybe trial or trouble comes and it's like hey, you exit out and you forget what you read that day and almost the doors lock and the water takes you back down and, you, and you, you're back down in the world again a little bit. Can I tell you this? You never come to the Word without the Word equaling out from where you are to where you ought to be so that you're on level ground. 
Some days, listen, some of, you need to, some of you need to take this to the bank. Some of you need to know this because it's going to be important to you. There's two ways to commit to Jesus. Commit your heart and your feelings to Him. And when you feel good and you feel happy and you feel excited, then it's easy. But you also got to commit your discipline to Jesus because some days you don't have the feelings. But you got the discipline. Let me tell you how else that works. It's kind of like I was told when Jenny and I were thinking about getting married and we went and saw our pastor and we did premarital counseling. It was, it was her student pastor and we, we kind of went through this thing and he said, he was here for somebody else. He said, when you get married, some days it's all about love and you living on love. Other days you stay married because it's about commitment and you're committed. So some days, love. Some days, it's commitment. Either one of them will keep you married. But you don't go in without one or the other. Can I tell you this? Jesus needs your feelings. He wants your heart. But also your commitment. When you read through the Psalms, what you're finding is that in just a moment, you're going to find the highs and lows of life. For instance, in just about 30 seconds, we're going to read a passage, a short passage, just about eight verses. And in that eight verses, you are going to read things like this. Verse 25 of this passage is going to say, my soul clings to the dust. You know what that means? It means he has hit rock bottom, not just in his body, but his heart is at rock bottom in life. Then... Three verses later, he's going to say this, and my soul, again, he's not just talking about his body, he's talking about his soul. See, it's bad whenever your body gets in trouble, but it's dangerous when your soul gets in trouble. He said, my soul melts with heaviness. And so, what we're finding is that verses like that are like a shot across the bow. They're a warning. They're a warning for any of us who, when we approach the Bible, we start assuming. Now listen, uh, assuming is a dangerous thing. But a lot of folks, when you first start out in your walk with Jesus or you look at other people for too long, you will start to assume that if you're going to live this spiritual life, then you have to at least pretend that your life is perfect, that your family is perfect, that your health is perfect, that everything in your life is perfect, and that you are perfectly capable of handling anything life throws at you. That you are perfect and can handle everything. A lot of people, they think that's what the spiritual life's about. And if they can't handle something, they say, what's wrong with me? Listen, you aren't built to ever handle everything. Do you know what you call the mentality that says, I've got to be perfect, stay perfect, act perfect, and if anything's not perfect, then my whole life's crumbling? You know what you, you, know what you call that idea of perfection? Being absolutely ridiculous. Can I just tell you this? There was only one perfect person who ever lived. He was betrayed by his closest friends, and he was murdered in his early 30s. So if your life is not perfect... If you got troubles, then friend, you have found a friend in Jesus and he can be everything to you. He knows. But that's not all the story. Though a soul may cling to the dust and though a soul may melt with heaviness, that's not all. Let's go to the fifth sec or the fourth section of this passage. It begins in verse number 25. Here's what your Bible says. We'll read it together. Here's what it says. My soul clings to the dust, so revive me according to your word. I have declared my ways and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me to understand the way of your precepts, so I shall meditate on your wonderful works. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying. By the way, can we just pause? I don't want you to see something. Why is this fellow asking God to remove from him the way of lying? Why didn't he say, remove from me the way of greed or pride or being a jerk or remove from it? You know what he's doing? That's probably something he struggled with. 
And so you really could just underline the, the word there and just say, Lord, all of us have something. If we were honest about our life, if we were asking for clean hands and a pure heart, surely there's something there we, we would ask that you would, you, would, you would refine out of us. Maybe the wisest thing you ever do is figure out your own blind spots. Of course, it may be there too that he's saying, God, remove from me the way of lying because of what others are saying. But notice, he never brings them into the story. Grant me your law graciously, is what he said. Verse number 30. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I cling to your testimonies. O Lord, do not let me be put to shame. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. You know what he means there by you shall enlarge my heart? Every time I read that, I think of, remember the old Christmas movie, The Grinch, the old one, the good one, you know? Where at the end of the story, the old Grinch's tiny little heart grows up into that big heart and he loves everybody at the end. You know how that happens? It happens because the old Grinch finally came out of his cave and he met some folks and those folks had an effect on him. You know what the psalmist is saying when he says, enlarge my heart, God? He said, God, I need you to do something in me that I can't produce myself. If I could have fixed myself, I would have by myself. So I need not a work that I can manufacture. I need a work from you. That's what he's saying. Now, I do want to acknowledge here, for those of you who read this passage and maybe kind of struggled with it in days past, I'll, I'll just go ahead and acknowledge right off the bat, this is... You got it exactly right. This is a very heavy passage. It's an, it's an, it's an emotional passage. It's some, as a matter of fact, sometimes when you read God's Word, the Psalms are praises. They're happy. They celebrate the goodness of God. And by the way, everybody loves the goodness of God. C.S. Lewis said, the most valuable thing of the Psalms to me is that the Psalms express in me the same level of delight in God which made David dance. And so some of the psalms are praises, some are thankful, some are encouraging. And by the way, I've never met a single person who suffered from too much encouragement in their life. But this is a psalm that we would label as a lament. A lament is written in sadness and suffering and it is intended to acknowledge that sometimes in our life it is biblical and honest and spiritual, and even normal. It is okay to not be okay. See, some of you walked into church this morning, and you you are not okay. You hadn't had an okay week. You hadn't had an okay family. You hadn't had an okay job. You had, things have not been okay. But when you walked in this morning, you carried your Bible, you put it under your arm, you forced yourself to come to church, which by the way is discipline and not feelings. You did it anyway. And you walked in and the first thing you did was you put your smile on and anytime anybody asked, how you doing today? You said, I'm great. How about you? And you're a liar for it. What if we just looked at life honestly and said, you know what, this week it's not good. But God is good and I'm here for God to change something in me that I can't change about myself. Can I tell you what? I think you may get more out of your day if you did something like that. I also want to walk you through something where it does say in this passage that my soul clings to the dust and my soul melts from heaviness. It also says, but teach me your statutes. And grant me your law graciously. See, because there's two sides to that coin. Yes, we are going to have days of trouble in this world. Jesus told us, in this world you will have trouble. A lot of people think that when they get into trouble, they are being punished. What if it's you're just being like Jesus? In this world you will have trouble. If they hated me, they will also hate you. That's what Jesus said. Let me say this too. He's saying, teach me your statutes and grant me your law graciously. Yeah, troubles may happen. But troubles do not mean that there is not something to learn from the troubles. When I find myself in these moments of need, I need God to step in and handle. Listen, 
We are not self-sufficient, no matter how much we might think and like to believe we are. Our sufficiency does not come from ourselves. Our sufficiency comes from God. He is the satisfier of our souls. So I don't just need to have my problems fixed. I need a new nature. And that's where Jesus is stepping in. Jesus is the one who, when He was born into the world, He brought mercy to the poor. Reconciliation and help to the broken. And He's now not just a great counselor or life coach who can coach us through, how do I handle my money? How do I handle my marriage? How do I raise my kids? What path should I choose in my life? Listen, we're not looking for self-help Jesus. Jesus does offer help, but listen, His help, the fruit of those things, comes after you get the first thing right. Jesus is the Savior of the world who died for our sins, was raised according to the power of God, and now bids all men come to Him. And my Jesus can do anything. But you first got to start with a personal relationship with Him. I like that because that is the very opposite way the enemy is going to work with you this week. By the way, God's Spirit is going to work on you this week. And the enemy is going to work on you this week. Let me tell you the difference. The devil is going to want you to pay attention to your feelings. How do you feel about what's going on? But Jesus is going to want you to pay attention to truth. How you feel is not always what's true. Matter of fact, what's true is not always something that you're going to even like when you hear it. But the enemy wants you to talk about your feelings. Jesus wants you to start with truth. For instance, look at verse number 27. He says, make me understand the ways of your precepts. He's asking for understanding, and who among us doesn't need to understand sometimes? Make me understand the way of your precepts, so I shall meditate on your wonderful works. Now you and I both know, come on. We both know that it's one thing to know something, but it's another ball game entirely to understand it. And we know that it's possible to be filled with a lot of knowledge. And still understand very little about life. Do you know what the bigger context of all of this is? Why he is asking so much for, teach me this, show me this, give me understanding. Do you know why he's asking over and over and over again? Because the psalmist has surrendered to the fact that on every single day, listen, every single day, God knows more than we do. And if God knows more than we do, if we are ever going to be wise, we need to hear from Him. By the way, if the Lord is also going to allow seasons of suffering in our life and moments of lamenting, then we also don't want to miss what His purpose is for it. If you're like me, you may find yourself way more teachable in moments of despair than in times of peace and joy. Times of peace and joy, I'm usually pretty good. Hold your head high, throw your shoulders back a little bit, and just march through life because it's a beautiful day. But there's something about when a situation in your life humbles you to your knees, you are in a fantastic position to finally figure out what's real about life. I'll never forget an afternoon, I got a phone call from a friend. He was one of my best buddies. He was in our wedding. He was uh, just, just a good, good buddy of mine. And I was serving in a church several hours from where he lived, but his dad kind of lived close. And he called me one afternoon and he said, he said, hey man, he said, my dad's in the hospital. His body's about gone. He had, uh, through drugs and alcohol his entire life, he's, he's a man in his 50s, and he's, he looks like he's 100. He said, Dad's about to die. I need to get there. He said, would you go? Now, I'd never met the man in my life, but I'm asking questions the whole time I'm, I'm going there. 
So I'm asking questions about what's, his, what's going on with, the, with him, what's, tell me the back story, and then we start getting into where he is with his faith. And, and here, he was one of those classic guys. He grew up in the South. He grew up in the Bible Belt. He grew up knowing you ought to go to church. He did every once in a while go to church, but he was kind of fringe at church. You know what? Church wasn't important to him, but he thought God was important. And what he meant by that was he believed that when he needed help, God would help him. And when he died, he would go to heaven. But God didn't play any other role into his life. Listen, the guy had never repented of his sins. He'd never placed his faith in Christ. He, he's never been a follower of Jesus. Now, he had good old boy religion. Good old boy religion was mama went to church, daddy went to church, grandma went to church. I go to church, so guess what? When I die, I'm going to go to heaven. That's good old boy religion. Biblical relationship says I've got to come to the realization that I'm a sinner. I must repent of my sins, placing my sins behind me through the forgiveness of Christ, have them washed away, commit my life to Jesus, and follow Jesus as if he's the only thing in all the world that matters, because he is. I'll never forget being by the bedside of that guy who never wanted to hear the gospel talk about Jesus his whole life. By the time I get to his bedside, he is, uh, he is nonverbal. He is moments from meeting God in eternity. And by the way, it's appointed unto man once to die. We're all going to do it unless if the Lord tarries. But then we'll face the judgment. Took his hand. Never met him before. It was awkward. Took his hand. And he could squeeze my hand. Me and a pastor buddy of mine, we began to share the gospel of Jesus. Not the good old boy faith. The gospel. That God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die for us. To take our sins, to take our debts, to take all, and to die as the sacrifice for those things out of his rich love for us. Because God showed us how much he loved us and that while we were still sinners, actively sinning, Christ died for us. And we're sharing the gospel with him. And I, I get to the end, I, I'm just a good, I'm just an old-fashioned just Roman road. We just went down the book of Romans. For there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That if I would confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we get to the invitation time of that deal. Listen, by that time we, my, we, we're, we're, we're fired up. And we're telling this guy, and he's listening. And we ask him at the very end, do you need to give your heart to Christ? And we developed a little system, one squeeze for yes, two for no. And he bears down with a yes. And we led him to faith in Christ. You ever heard about a deathbed moment, deathbed conversion? That was it. There are wonderful miracles. But the person who lives their life waiting for their deathbed, I mean, it's just rolling the dice if you're going to have that opportunity, you know. But he did. He spent his whole life not wanting to talk about Jesus. But when his health in his strong body, his whole life gave out. You know what it did? It humbled that man to a point where finally he's, re he's willing to understand God is bigger than me. You ever been humbled that way? By the way, it's better to humble yourself than to wait for God to humble you because he is kind, but he will humble. He will humble. When you read through the psalm, what you're finding is, in essence, the biblical writer is suffering through some very dark, depressing, and troublesome days. 
I showed you, remember, every, every section of this psalm is based on a letter. Every letter has eight verses that start with that same letter. This is the fourth section that, of this passage. And there's a Hebrew letter. It's called the, the letter Dalit. It's their D sound. And so every, every verse of these eight verses begins with this letter. I'm going to put it on screen just so you can see it. This is the Hebrew letter. And you know what? Remember that, that in, the, uh, in language that probably written language started with pictures that became symbols, that became letters, that then became foreign words. This one, the, the, the idea is the, the Hebrews believe this is a stick man who's been knocked over and broken. He's either, he's either, he's either holding his knees exhausted, panting for breath, or he's like, a, he's like a tree out in the woods that a tornado has taken and just broken it over sideways. And maybe he's using this here with this lament because he knows what, just what it means to be exhausted. Maybe he feels tired, broken, and thrown for a loop. So you know what he's asking for? Not a solution. Never once does he ask for a solution in this passage. You know what he asks for? Revival. Because he has become wise enough to know that his problems aren't just physical in nature, they're spiritual. I, for one, am so grateful the Lord records stuff like this so that we can know we're not on an island all by ourselves when we go through hard times too. Do you know what I've seen a hundred times over the years, far too many times, and it, it hurts me every time to see it? I've seen some believers that I know and that I love and that I can see genuine fruit and evidence of their walk, their close relationship with the Lord Jesus. And I've seen them go through, they love Jesus, but they go through some terrible life moments. By the way, none of us are exempt. Anybody ever tells you if you follow Jesus and you trust him enough, you'll never have another problem in your life? Mark them off as a heretic and don't listen to him anymore. It's not true. I've seen these godly people. I've seen them get sick. I've seen them lose loved ones, lose marriages, lose children, lose the abilities they once, uh, they once defined them, their strength or their, 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 their toughness, their grit, and they lost it. Age took it from them, maybe. And then I've seen them struggle with depression because they go through something really problematic and troublesome and traumatic in their life. And they're suffering, but then I've seen them, listen to this, I've seen them really suffer after that. Because somewhere along the way, the devil slipped up close and he told them that if they're feeling sad or depressed, that they should feel bad and ashamed and feel guilty for feeling bad. I've seen good, godly believers be lied to by the, by the devil, being told things like this, you must not have enough faith. You just don't trust God enough. If you trusted God enough, you'd be happy. You being depressed, you being like this, you being troubled, you being discouraged, it's because you don't love God enough. And I've seen folks listen to them. I'm here to tell you it's lies. If that ever happens to you, if that ever is part of your life, I want you to take your Bible and I want you to turn to the verses we've just read this morning and know that if this Bible writer inspired by the Holy Spirit can feel down and sad and depressed and struggling, if he can feel this way, then you are not in sin when you feel that way either. But if you do find yourself in those positions, you can know that God he is your shield. He is your portion. He is your refuge. And He will not abandon you. From the top of this verse, of this passage to the bottom, here's what you're going to see. Verse number 25 says, My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Verse number 31 says, I cling to your testimonies. Oh Lord, do not put me to shame. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying that everybody in their life clings to something. And usually, whatever you hold on to the tightest 
is all you're going to be left when the tornadoes of life come through and they blow everything else away. What you hold on to the tightest is usually what you got. And if that be true, then dear God, let us be people who are found holding on to Jesus when those moments hit in our lives. God hides some of His most precious treasures in our most painful of experiences. So don't waste them. You can follow the progression of this passage in verse 27. He says, I meditate on your wonderful works. In verse 30, he says, I've chosen the way of truth. In verse 31, he says, I cling to your testimonies. And in verse 32, he says, and I will run the course. So he starts with thinking and he's ending with running. Do you know what's happened? That as he has gone through his troubles in life, he is absorbing God's Word. And as he absorbs God's Word in his heart, he, he, and he obeys it, then both his confidence and his trust are lifted above to the next area out. He's able to push on. He's on his face when all this starts, and at the end he's running on. And the only explanation is that God has been his strength. Friends, he can be your strength too. You know, at some point, everybody wants to know the secret of surviving the tough days of life. And I'm not an expert by any means. I'm having to learn and then relearn most of this stuff on a daily basis. I'm having to learn and relearn dependence on God at every turn. But here's what I do know. God is faithful. You can always look up. You can always trust Him. You can always run to Him. And you never have to be disappointed in the long term on what God allows in the short term because God plays the long game. I'm going to end with this, verse 30. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I have chosen the way of truth. In the good times and the bad times of life, whatever you're in, and listen, I'm telling you, some folks in this room, you're living the good life. It will not last. So prepare for the bad. Some folks in here are living through the hard times of life. Can I tell you this? Look at me. It will not last. There is an eternal God who has a plan for you. And even if this world fails you, there is a kingdom up ahead that He has prepared a place for you in. That there will be no sorrow and no trouble and no trial and no sickness and no death and no separation. You say, why hasn't a good God created for us a perfect world? He has. You're just not there yet. But you will be one day. So this writer says he's made his choice. I've chosen the way of truth. Imagine, if you will, all of the people and all of the generations that went to the synagogues, reading the Scripture and praying and singing and moving as they prayed and sang and read. And they get to this verse, I have chosen the way of truth. And they go, is that poetic? What does it mean? I don't know. Let's sing it anyway. I've chosen the way of truth. Now, years later, a seemingly insecure carpenter out of Galilee, who is the Messiah, steps from the shadows of society and he tells everybody, hey, the way of truth that's me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of all of God's laws and promises. Now he sits at the right hand of God and he bids all men, all women, all boys, all girls, come to me. All who are weary and overburdened come to me and I will give you rest 
Do you need the rest of God today? Because I'm telling you, not because I say so, because the Word says so, you can have it today. Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give our souls this day daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because in our lives, yours is the power and the glory and authority forever and ever. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I wonder this. Maybe this morning you're going through a dark day. In just a moment, we'll stand. We'll open up our front area here. It's our altar. You can kneel here at the front. You can sit on the front row. You can stand. You can kneel at these steps. You can kneel in front of these chairs. I don't care what you do. But listen, if you've brought in a weight that today you are overburdened, I'm going to invite you to come lay it down to Jesus today. It may be that you're here this morning and you've known Jesus for a long time. You've been saved for years and years now. Do you need revival? Have you noticed in your own life, your soul being kind of at a low point, a dryness in your spiritual life, a a something that just isn't right? Do you need revival? Well, what if today you confessed all of your sins in front of the Lord, repented your way to His way? Remember, He is the way. And you just followed Jesus. How would that change your life today? Just a moment, we're going to stand. I'm going to slip out of the side aisle. I'm going to go to the back. We're going to have a time of invitation where you are invited to respond. There's some of you who've been visiting our church for a long time, and maybe God has put it in your heart to join our church. If you can say, I know this is where God wants me or my family, then we'd be happy to have you. Maybe others here today who say, I've heard about Jesus, but today I want to know him for myself. I have heard about him all my life, but now my eyes want to see him for myself. You know, this morning as we opened our Bible, what we find every single time we worship together is the scriptures always invite us for a response. And maybe it is this morning that as you've been considering, uh, you'd like to place your faith in Jesus or you'd like to talk with somebody about it. I want to give you an email address this morning. MyNextStepPHBC at gmail.com If this morning you'd like to reach out and connect with somebody and talk to about how to place your faith in Jesus or just general questions about what you may have going on in your life and somebody to pray with you, would you email us today? I promise we'll get back with you. We want to help you along in this journey. We hope you have a wonderful week. And we pray God's blessings on you. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for a day worshiping today. We pray that as we've sung, as we've opened the Bible, that, Father, you've drawn us near and that this week we'll follow you. We pray for those who need to reach out and talk with somebody about placing faith in Christ. We pray that this morning they would do that and, Father, they would find Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.